Hi, I'm Gretchen Blatz, and like you, I'm wild about Washington. Feeding elk during the winter has been a challenge for agency employees for many years. It's about to become less challenging thanks to the creativity of one of our own people. It was a high labor, uh, took a minimum of two people. We switched to the big bales and as we was feeding them we thought there had to be a better way. So we came up with this feeder to lessen the labor and do it with one person. Well, we use a tractor with a set of forks on the front, and we spear these big bells that uh, weigh anywhere from 12 to 1,400 pounds. We load them. It's a one-man operation loading them. Uh, then we drive out into the feedlot, cut the strings, and we control the flakes and the size from inside the cab, and we do all the feeding from inside the cab. For a remote location and it saves somebody from driving up here, uh, mileage the hour driving up here to feed. It gives us more flexible feeding times where we can feed earlier and with a lot less manpower and, and dollars. We feed from inside the cab. Nobody has to ride on the truck uh, with loose loads, shifting loads. No chance of anybody falling off. When it's blowing and 10 degrees out, uh, the hay shaft going down your shirt, I just figured there had to be another way, better way of doing this. With this feeder here on this feed lot, uh, it'll save us about 10 to 13,000 a, a feeding season here. Really, by switching to the, the large bales, um, the, the three by four foot bales, um, we, we believe that we've helped to reduce the risk of disease transmission. Um, I think in the video you'll be able to see that the animals circle around that large flake of hay uh, so their hind ends are, are pointed out um, and I think that they actually <clears throat> end up uh, doing less fighting uh, because they all kind of have their noses in and, and their butt ends out and I haven't seen near as much of the fighting going on so we do have injuries that occur because of that, um, and then again, reducing the risk of, of disease transmission. We believe with the, with the larger flakes that, that it is a more efficient use by the elk, uh, that we have less wastage, less hay left on the ground, uh, which reduces our, our feeding costs, the amount of hay that we have to buy. We started feeding elk uh, back in the late 60s on a regular basis. Um, elk fences had been put in to keep the animals from going down uh, into the agricultural lands uh, where we've got hay fields and, and orchards. Uh, we have a law in the state of Washington that says that if uh, our animals are damaging private property crop land, uh, that they w the landowner can be compensated for that. So it became an issue of, of trying to keep the elk from getting down onto those uh, crop lands. And because of that, and because those are our best winter range uh, grounds, it became necessary to feed the animals to get them through the winter. One of the keys to the recovery of wild salmon is redirection of the state's hatcheries. Here's an update on that issue from a recent Seattle conference. We have a hundred hatcheries in the state of Washington, and they're owned by the state and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, some of them are tribal, um, and they have a profound impact on on salmon and most of the, the reason we had them was to mitigate for the loss of these and the decline of these salmon runs and there have been legitimate questions raised about can you have these uh, hatcheries for sustainable fisheries and still protect the wild salmon and to bring back the wild salmon runs and I think this is of course the primary challenge that we face. The unique and groundbreaking effort the Department of Fish and Wildlife is working shoulder to shoulder with the tribes to set a new standard for the way we operate our hatcheries. To make sure that hatcheries provide a sustainable fishery to the tribes and other fishermen of Washington State, but also in a way that simply does not uh, uh, minimize the impact on wild salmon, but in a way that enhances the recovery of wild salmon. 
with such strong and competing views, this could have turned into a very ugly fight over the Endangered Species Act. But thankfully, some very bright scientists approached our state's congressional delegation with a hatchery reform plan that would benefit everyone. There was nobody left out. Hatcheries do not take the place of the habitat. They will never will, they never can. And we need the habitat, we need the hatcheries. These fisheries today contribute more than $1 billion annually to the state's economy and are the lifeblood of many of our rural, coastal communities. For example, last year's hugely successful spring fisheries for Columbia River hatchery fish netted local merchants on both sides of the river an estimated 15 to 18 million dollars in business. Said simply by the spokesman, spokesman's review out of Spokane, cash flow, return of salmon, steelhead pumps big bucks into ailing economy. Want a spring fishing adventure? Try the lakes of the east side for walleye. It doesn't get much better than this. Walleye are a large member of the perch family. They provide uh, year-round angling in Washington waters. Um, generally in the springtime though you can find nice calm days like today, a little sunshine, a little early warmth, and uh, great fishing too. Uh, we're fishing here at Banks Lake today. Currently our regulations on walleye throughout most parts of the state are uh, 18 inch minimum. But come May 1st, uh, that will change to a 16-inch minimum, which is going to make a lot more fish available to harvest. Uh, the limit's five fish. But there's enough changes from uh, water to water that you really want to check your regulation pamphlet to make sure you understand what the rules are on the water you're fishing. Walleye are only found in eastern Washington uh, irrigation district reservoirs and the Columbia River system. They're not in western Washington. And uh, today we've got a couple of friends, Gordon Steinmetz and Don Hall, with some tips on how to catch springtime walleye. Don't fish them with a lot of action. We basically uh, uh, subtle, pretty subtle lift and drop, just trying to maintain contact with the bottom. Uh, we use a little bit of a plastic uh, tracker. This is a pulse worm here. We just bait up with a, a half a crawler, hooked on here, string them back. Just kind of dra drag it around out there. Talk a little bit about reservoirs in April. This is pre-spawn time. They haven't spawned yet and they won't spawn until about the last week in April. So what they're doing, they're staging right now. And this is one of the systems that we use in the, some of these pre-spawn areas. It's kind of the same thing that we used on the river, except we're not vertical. What we're fishing is big, huge flats, like say on Banks Lake, Barker Flats. It's the same Berkeley pulse worm with the Whistler jig head. Tip that with a crawler or without. And what we do, we're in about 40 feet of water and maybe a little shallower up to 30 in April. And what we do is we just flip this out behind the boat, get on your bow mount. And what we're doing is using the bow mount to just drag this along real slow, about two tenths to three tenths of a mile an hour. And you Hit the bottom, you're out behind the boat, say, what, Don, 25, 30, 40 feet, maybe further? Maybe further. Right. Yeah. With your finger on the line, and the only thing you'll feel is a little, hold your hand out, Don, is just a little thump, like you thumped your fingernail. That's about all you're going to feel. And you can have some days out here. We've had, you know, 10, 15 fish days. We've had two fish days. Uh, weather plays a big part in this. A barometer, if you're getting a fallen barometer, it's going to be slow or storms coming in. Cold fronts, which happens, we get a lot of wind this time of the year too. If you bundle up and get out there, uh, it's an opportunity to fish for walleyes 365 days a year in Washington if you want to. The Columbia River system is open, the reservoirs are open. Some place you can fish for walleyes 365 days a year. It's spring and the salmon are back in the Columbia River. Here's Tony Flores' report. April is a fabulous month in Washington for outdoor fishing activities. To name a few, 
the ocean razor clam season, we'll have another opportunity to dig those wonderful clams. And shell fishing on Puget Sound beaches should be very, very good. It's a great month to do that. Of course, the opening of the lowland lake season also occurs during April. But we're down here today on the Columbia River. And the Columbia River is expecting another wonderful return of spring Chinook. Today, Joe Heimer is with us from the Department of Fish and Wildlife, and Joe helps manage this Spring Chinook run. He also fishes for Spring Chinook in his off time. So Joe's going to give us a couple tips on where to and how to. Uh, share with us a couple of your secrets in terms of gear and how you approach being successful on Spring Chinook. Okay. Well, I think there's a couple things uh, in general rule is on the incoming tide, you, you mainly troll. And on the outgoing tide, you have an option of either trolling or anchoring up with the flatfish. Um, basically, when you troll, you want to use a spreader bar, a small weight, and keep the depth like 5 to 20 feet of water. And, uh, and on, the in on the outgoing tide, you'll use a flatfish, uh, a little bit longer dropper, shorter leader, and uh, a lot of guys use sardines or herring or some kind of other scent with, the, with their artificial bait. Before we go out in, on the river in a few minutes, Joe, um, for people that haven't fished for spring chinook before, why do you think spring chinook are such a good sport fish or worth uh, putting in, investing the time and the money to go fishing for spring chinook? Well, they're really one of the premium salmon because they come in now and they don't spawn until August, September. So they're really, all their fats and oils are saved up so they can go over the summer until they spawn. So when they come in, they're just prime condition fish. Okay, let's get out on the river and see if we can find a few. One of, the, one of the, the guesses that people have to make is when to come down here. Mm -hmm. So what's the best way that you'd recommend for people to stay in touch with when to come fishing in this lower Columbia River? Okay, probably the best uh, information you can get is actually on the department's website. You can get the fish counts at the various dams. You can get the creel sampling results. And you can also find out where all the boat ramps are too. So you can get a lot of information in one, one uh, stop shopping. Okay. Uh, that's it with Joe Heimer today on Fishing for Spring Chinook. Don't forget, the new license went into effect on April the 1st, so be sure and pick up your license before you come down to the river. If you can't get out here to chase one of these wonderful Spring Chinook, here's some other fishing opportunities in Washington. Here's where to see Washington's wildlife during the next few weeks. This has been Wild About Washington, brought to you by the employees of the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. Working together, we can save Washington's outdoor heritage for future generations. Thank you for watching, and please join us again.